All right, going, guys? Jeff here. Today is Wednesday. I mean, throat's feeling a little bit better, but it's still a little bit um, painful when I do swallow my saliva. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're going to be talking about how the Federal Reserve kind of tanked the market yesterday. So if you're looking at your NASDAQ and your S&P from yesterday, chances are you're going to be down a little bit uh, simply because Lyle Brainard, which was supposedly, um, you know, um, on par with Jerome Powell supposedly going for the chairperson uh, for the Federal Reserve. Uh, basically, she came out, okay? Do understand that Lyle Brainard is one of the biggest duffs in the Federal Reserve. And, you know, being a duff simply means that she is very, very positive and she really looked forward for a good market and such. That's the kind of perspective a duff takes. And Lyle Brainard is a huge duff, Okay. But yesterday, during the statement for the Federal Reserve, she basically came out to talk about how um, they will be going through a rapid pace for um, cutting off with their balance sheet runoff and such. So, of course, today we'll be talking quite strongly on this part, uh, simply because we're going to be getting the FOMC meeting minutes for March, which, let's be honest, there would be a good chance that this will really affect the market even more when the minutes do actually come out. Uh, the minutes should be coming out at about 2 a.m., if I'm not mistaken. So uh, we are looking forward for the minutes for us to really see what is going to be happening um, in the market in the next few weeks from this. But anyway, let's cover some news today. All right, so first up, let, let's get the easy ones out of the way. Amazon spending billions of dollars on space launches as SpaceX ramps up satellite internet services. Uh, so this is Project uh, Kuiper, I think, Kuiper. Um, it secured up to 83 planned launches that will ferry satellites to orbit over a five-year stretch. Um, so, yeah, basically, space race between Amazon and uh, SpaceX. Um, honestly, I don't really have that much thoughts about this because I think the whole space exploration uh, industry at the moment, I do think that it is, I wouldn't think that it's redundant per se, but of course it is something that is way beyond just your primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, progression as such. I think it's even more. Uh, so yeah, it's so advanced to the point where I don't think that it's going to be benefiting us in the very, very near short-term future. So of course, there's not going to be a lot of people who actually care enough for us to actually talk more about this uh, in more details and such. Um, hence my own uh, opinions being limited about this as well. All right, so next up, we have to talk about the whole Russia-Ukraine, which is quite huge, okay? Uh, yeah, over here. Zelensky says Russia still aims for an occupation, and <laughs> I'm just saying, I've been saying this since, I think, the second day of the war, which is from the 25th of February. I've said it before. Russia would eventually go towards an occupation, Right now, of course, it's not saying that it's confirmed to be an occupation, but that's what Zelensky is thinking as well. He says that Russia still aims for an occupation, which I honestly think that that would be the case. This would be a long, drawn-out situation. But of course, you know, we do not know how long will that occupation last. Historically, historically, it lasts for about two to three years or so. But I do not think that this is going to last two to three years. I do think that it's going to be ending in 2022 alone. But of course, it will require a lot of efforts for them to really come in onto this, which is why even the West is also throwing on new sanctions on um, Russia as well. So we will also be going through some of the sanctions. Of course, I don't think that there are any like real um, effective sanctions uh, to the point where it's actually worth talking about uh, because if they actually do throw with some very, very effective sanctions, uh, it would of course um, be responded with even more effective sanctions from uh, Russia's side as well. And like I said before, this is also one of the scenarios that I actually planned for as well because I do understand that, that there is a good possibility of this actually going towards this direction. Uh, so I don't want to say that it's actually going according to plan because of course this is a very negative thing for this whole situation to be playing out this way as well. But I do think that my own um, my own methodically planned out situation is really working out as it is. I do think that um, you know Russia is going to continue uh, with their current stance on this whole situation and they are going to most likely push forward still spread the same amount of uh, the same quality of information around the country uh, so that people still think that russia is of a certain nature before they actually enter this whole invasion all over again and such so i do not think that uh, this will really end into a world war three per se simply because i don't think that the us the uk and the uh, european countries are comfortable enough to really um, invade uh, Russia to that extent. 
Um, and at the same time, I don't think that China or India and uh, Pakistan is ready to stand on, or North Korea is ready to stand on um, Russia's side to really come in uh, to fight Ukraine. Um, you know, thinking of that uh, from that perspective as well. So yeah, you know, personally, I do think that um, the more this actually evolve into a weird um, fight, I guess, a weird war between like multiple countries. Right now, basically, what's happening is everyone is just pumping their resources into an avatar and letting the two avatar fight it out. Uh, and right now, of course, you know, we do think that Ukraine do stand a higher chance, uh, especially with all the positive news that is coming out from the, this whole thing as well. But let's not forget that, you know, with citizen massacre happening in uh, Ukraine by the Russian military as well. It's not just the it's not just Putin that is doing the wrong things right now. It's going to the point where it is the Russian people in general. Uh, okay, well, I don't want to call it in general, uh, the Russian military in general. Uh, and I do think that it's going to start to get a little bit more dangerous. And this might actually incite the other countries who are behind Ukraine to really step into this because they, the last thing anyone wants would be citizen casualties. Okay, military casualties to a certain extent, they're considered as means to an end for them to actually fight a war. Okay, so... To a, to a certain extent, most of it is actually planned out. But in terms of citizens-wise, I do think that a lot of countries are going to be a little bit more sensitive when it comes down to citizens being massacred and such. Uh, so yeah, you know, that's kind of my thought on this whole situation for now. All right. So oil, oil as well. Okay? Oil fluctuates as EU avoids immediate sanctions on a Russian crude. So same thing, you know, the US, the UK... The, all of them are throwing new sanctions over um, for Russian crude. They're throwing at, you know, economics. They're throwing at banks. They're throwing at people, okay? Be it, like, you know, Putin's, uh, I think Putin's family and such. But it doesn't really matter because EU, which is the European Union, avoids immediate sanctions on Russian crude. Like I said before, they need Russian crude more than Russia needs them in a certain aspect. And if a Russia were to kind of say that, you know, all Russian crude is going to be in rubles, no negotiation whatsoever, EU will eventually have to give up and just say, all right, we're going to be buying more rubles to deal with you guys so that we can continue having affordable crude for us to actually supply for our countries to actually keep the economy going. That's the kind, that's kind of the where, where the st a standstill is at, at the moment. So uh, I do think that that's going to be there's got to be a lot of negotiation, or, uh, negotiation to be happen on this side. So it's going to be quite interesting for us to actually go through that. So yeah, okay, Russia faces new ref of um, sanctions. Okay, so let's kind of just go through it a little bit. Uh, Hungary uh, government summons Ukraine ambassador over insults. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to read these. Uh, US to impose a fresh, a fresh sanctions, ban all new investment in Russia. Uh, EU readies new sanction on Russia targets coal ex uh, imports. Uh, honestly speaking, these are, I think that these are just the normal sanctions. Like I said before, I don't think that these are good enough or strong enough for them to actually uh, deter Russia from continuing this uh, long drawn out fight. Okay, so we'll see how it actually goes. All right, uh, next up, let's get the easy one out, out of the way China, long weekend tourism spend plunges to 39.2% of pre-pandemic levels. So for people who are not sure of this, Shanghai and also I think Shenzhen and also Beijing um, uh, are all still under lockdown for some of the parts of the of the, um, of the cities and states. Uh, so yeah, you know, we have a long holiday weekend in, um, for early April and they're still going through a whole lockdown. Uh, this is definitely not going to be helping much. And this would actually... In fact, not only not help, but this will also affect a lot of the situation because, you know, supply chain is going to be affected. I think that's the first thing that comes to everyone's mind when it comes to the lockdown. Okay, what 2020 have taught us and 2021 have taught us is that upon lockdown, the word lockdown, expect supply chain issues. That's going to happen no matter what. We have seen it happen in 2020 and 2021 so much to the point where supply chain became such a buzzword that it's going to be used in every single article. Okay. Every single time inflation go up, 
supply chains. People not enough money supply chains. World hunger supply chains. Literally, that's the case. War supply chain. And it become very, very evident that, you know, China is definitely a very, very important and integral part of the whole supply chain. So be it, you know, manufacturing your food resources and such, they hold a very, very integral role. So, yeah. All right. Next up, let's talk a little bit more about Twitter. Um, okay. So I already uploaded a video on this um, earlier in the afternoon, I actually recorded recorded it last night, uh, which I basically talked to you guys all about how the whole Twitter sphere is like, the whole saga about how Elon Musk is joining it. And earlier today, not earlier yesterday, Elon Musk refiled his 13G to a 13D. Okay, because the, the, a 13G basically you can it's just a passive, you're just holding on to a passive um position. Okay, you're not supposed to join the board of directors, you're not supposed to join the shareholders, you're not supposed to have a vote, you're not supposed to have a call in anything. Okay, you're just a an investor like one of us. Okay, however, by filing a 13D, you are now part of the board of directors and you are un unable to buy over the whole company, essentially. Okay, because what what Elon Musk can basically do when he was filing his 13G, first of all, if he were to do anything more than 5%, he would have to let the SEC know and then file it properly, which he didn't. Um, but then afterwards, because he filed as a 13D, then afterwards he actually went to the SEC to actually clear that up. We're not sure if that's, that's going to have any uh, consequences in the future. We might. We'll see how it goes. But the thing is, if he did file a 13G, Technically, if, if he really wanted to buy 20% of the company, he could. If he got the money, he can easily buy 20% of the company. That could actually happen. But the thing is that because right now, he's actually an activist instead of a, pass, a passive investor, he can now, being part of the board of, the, uh, board of directors, he can only own up to 14.9% of the Twitter shares in, in all of the company. He can only hold maximum up to 14.9%. And right now, of course, it doesn't really make sense for him to get even more shares uh, into the company because right now he is literally the biggest shareholder as it is. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting for us to really see how it goes. You know, uh, I don't think that this is going to be just one of his trades. I don't think this is going to be like one of his Bitcoin back in 2020 when he bought Bitcoin using Tesla and just say, Hey, I just want to show you guys that, you know, Tesla is a good store of value. I don't think that's, that's the play that he's going for. I do think that he is quite interested and he really cares about Twitter as a platform. I don't think he's going to just go in just to like get rid of the whole entire platform. I don't think that's going to be the case. I do think that he's going to be giving out proper improvements and feedback on how the platform can actually improve in the future. So I do think that Elon Musk is going to be a good addition to the company. However, of course, that also comes with its own set of problems because of how he is as a person. I cannot really imagine Elon Musk being in a board of directors and not really just taking over the whole entire meeting on his own. I've seen him on a lot of interviews, on a lot of podcasts and such. I don't think that he's the kind of guy who's just laid back and just be like, yeah, that's that's a yes from me, that's a no from me, that kind of thing. I do think that he's going to be someone who's just going to come out and just be like, yeah, I don't get why you should do this. You know, how about we actually try this out? And like he, he probably has thought, of, thought out of many various methods of doing a certain uh, functions and I think that that's the eccentric side of him, his, his, uh, of himself and I do think that's go that's going to be shown in the board of directors meeting and such I don't think he's going to be that passive even though he's in the board of directors uh, so yeah you know that's going to be very interesting for us to really see but yeah I'm very very glad that he did refile it so that at least the SEC will like get off his back on that um, but yeah you know cool cool news Twitter confirms it's testing edit button after Elon Musk posts its follower. Uh, but yeah, nothing much about that, honestly speaking. All right, now let's talk about the whole brain art situation, okay? I have the uh, rooters on here as well. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, this is fine. Okay, brain, Fed's brain art says reducing elevated inflation is of a paramount importance, okay? Something that we really have to dive deep into this, okay? A top Federal Reserve official said that the central bank is strongly committed to taking steps that will reduce infl inflation this year, including by improving, uh, approving significant reduction in its $9 trillion asset portfolio at its policy meeting early next month. 
Okay, so we are going to be having an F FOMC uh, FOMC 2022. Let's see, we are going to be having an FOMC in May. Okay, we are third, third and fourth of May. Okay, we are going to be having an FOMC then. Okay, so Fed Governor Lyle Brainard, who is awaiting sen uh, Senate confirmation to serve as Fed's uh, vice chairwoman. I think right now it's still... Um, <sighs> I can't, I can't believe I forgot the name, the old woman. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, said she anticipated shrinking the asset portfolio, uh, sometimes referred to as the balance sheet, okay, the, the whole balance sheet runoff and such, and a series of interest rate increases to follow the Fed's policy stance to a more neutral position that no longer provides stimulus on to the economy later this year. It is of paramount importance to get inflation down, Mr. Brainard said Tuesday at a virtual conference hosted by the Federal Reserve. Blah, blah. According, accordingly, the committee will continue tightening monetary policy methodically through a series of interest rate increases and by starting to reduce the balance sheet at a rapid pace as soon as our May meeting. So, do understand what she's basically saying right here. Methodically, <laughs> uh, through a series of interest rate increases, Right now, we are already, at, well, okay, the market has already priced in eight rate hikes in 2022. Eight rate hikes. That's what we kind of priced in because according to the previous FOMC, that's what we are pricing in at the moment. Personally, I do think that we are going to be expecting 10 rate hikes, 10 to even 11 rate hikes. I'm not going to lie. I do think that there is a good possibility for us to actually go up 11 times if we are looking at a 25 basis point increment over time. But what Brainard is actually saying over here is that there is a possibility that we would get 50 basis point increment in quick succession in the next few increment. So for example, instead of us actually having, let's say, eight rate, uh, like 11 rate hikes with 25 basis point increment, we're going to get 50, 50, 50, and then 25, 25, 25, and the, the left over 25 might run for like another six more, six more rate hikes. So effectively, it's still like about what, like nine rate hikes? But if you actually break them up into 25 basis point increment, you, are, you might be looking at 14 uh, uh, interest rate hikes instead. And of course, I do think that that is a very, very good possibility as well. If inflation continues to, you know, hit higher and higher every single month. And let's be honest, you know, with the CPI going to be coming out in the next week uh, on the 12th of April, okay, we're expecting um, the CPI to be out. We're going to be expecting very, very bad news there as well. Because if a CPI report comes out that shows us 1.1% month over month, I'm almost certain that the May meeting that uh, they are going to be having, we're going to be looking at, at a 50 basis point hike. Without a doubt. Because if they don't stop this current inflation going up higher and higher and higher, think about it this way. If they are trying to increase the rates by 0.25%, having a month over month of 1.1%, for example, my own thoughts, 1.1%, for example, 1.1%, that month alone is enough to cover your entire year of increment, of rates increment. And that's the scary part of how inflation is destroying whatever the Fed is, is thinking about. And of course, it's at the same time, the Feds cannot just scare the market by saying, all right, we're going to be increase the rates to 4% and we're going to hold this 4% for the next like four months and then we're going to bring it back down. That's going to be worse for the, for the whole entire country because you're just going to have a huge fluctuation of assets uh, runoff, getting out of control. People are immediately going to be selling off everything. The moment it hits 4%, everything is going to be sold. And we're going to instantly hit a recession. And that's the last thing the Federal Reserve wants to do. And I'm pretty sure that's what that's what Jerome Powell would never want to do. Never. So, yeah. So, that's kind of the, the concern here. But let's, so let's continue on, okay? Longer dated Treasury securities sold off sharply after Ms. Brainard's remark, which emphasized how the portfolio runoff will be larger and faster than the last time the Fed strength its holding. The year on the benchmark 10-year Treasury note, which rises when bond price fall, jumped to 2.55% Tuesday from 2.465% just before she spoke and 2.409% on Monday. Okay. The more we see the 10-year Treasury note increase in their yield, it simply means that people are running out of the stocks market and going into bonds. Okay. People are getting into bonds. People are just worried. And, you know, 
bond prices is falling, okay? But people are just worried about the stock market. Yesterday, just look at the S&P 500, okay? S&P 500 basically just dropped. Uh, well, if you look at, um, like, a, I think about 1.30, yeah, about 1.30 a.m. in Singapore, 1.30 a.m., you can see a huge drop out of nowhere. Um, for the next, like, 30 minutes, it was just red candles throughout. And this is the S&P 500. You know, if you look at the QQQ, it's going to be the same thing as well. Okay, people are, are very, very fearful at the moment. And even if we were to look at the VIX at the moment, okay, the VIX is currently at 22. Okay, I think three days or four days ago, we we're looking at the VIX being at about, I don't know, like 14, 14 points right now. It's at 22, which means that the volatility is increasingly higher and higher every single day. Of course, I do understand that we do have fears on the war. Of course, with this current war possibly going towards an, an occupation, that's going to be a huge um, fear catalyst that we have to look out for as well. And secondly, I'm pretty sure that the market was very, very fearful of what uh, Lyle Brainard actually said in the statement yesterday. But what I don't get, however, is that this does not really change my perspective on the market as a whole. Okay, Because the thing is that, this isn't things that was not already expected from the previous FOMC. These were these are not new information. These are information that was already provided in the previous FOMC by Jerome Powell. And we already understand that the balance sheet runoff is going to be happening. But it's, it was simply because of the change of terms that Lyle Brainard used in this statement, okay? Uh, which would be here. Tightening monetary policy methodically through a series of interest rate incre uh, in interest rates increases, okay, by starting to reduce the balance sheet at a rapid pace as soon as our May meeting. Okay, so what is the worry about the market? Is because the market's main worry is at the moment if Lyle Brainard after a May meeting, which we are expecting one of the worst CPI report right after, right before this meeting, okay? We are going to, okay, because they don't look at the CPI, they look at the PCE, which would got, which will be happening right before this FOMC meeting, okay? This FOMC meeting is going to happen on the 3rd of May. The PCE is going to come out on the like 30th of April, okay? So this is going to be happening immediately after. And the Federal Reserve loves to use the PCE. They don't use the CPI, but they're basically the same thing. So if we see a horrible CPI, chances are the PC is going to be some, somewhere in between. Okay, if we see 1.1% here, the PC is most likely going to be seeing like 0.9% or something ridiculous as well. It's still going to be one of the highest inflationary pressure that we have ever had in the past, I don't know, 60 years. It's just going to get higher and higher. You know, we, we heard the 20 years, the 30 years, the 40 years, 50 years, maybe, I don't know. Okay, and it's going to happen. Okay. That is going to be uh, the concern because after the PCE comes out, you know, then the FOMC is going to happen. People are going to worry. Okay, interest rate is going to go up to fifty percent. Ah, no, fifty zero point five uh, percent increase. Okay, it's going to be a fifty basis point hike, and at the same time, they're going to reduce the balance sheet way, way, way faster. AKA, they're going to sell a lot of their stocks inside their portfolio, inside their $9 trillion portfolio, they're going to be selling and selling and selling and selling. That's the worry that people have, okay? But again, like I said before, this is not something that comes off as new news because these are all already kind of expected from the previous FOMC meeting. We already expected a sell-off, well, a balance sheet runoff, okay, to be happening as we increase our rates, Nothing changed. So, of course, I do think that... I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm going to be smarter than any of those investors out there or people who are, the, you know, market makers and such. I'm not saying that that's going to be the case. However, I do think that they probably just took into consideration of what the general retail investors probably felt and they were just playing their cards alongside with it. If they were the first to sell off a huge portion of it, and they can create a sell-off and they have a proper reason of why they want to do a sell-off. The moment they actually do that, SPY just went down and they think that it is better for them to actually reallocate their portfolio back into bonds and such. 
maybe that's the right play. We cannot judge. And because of that, I do think that that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, we had such a bad SMP run and uh, QQQ run as well. So yeah, okay, over here, facts, minutes to review, long-awaited details on the balance sheet plan. Okay, so this is going to be very, very in integral as well because this is going to be the facts minutes are gonna, that is going to be announced later on at 2 a.m. in Singapore time. Okay, so we'll be going through um, what's going to be written in the facts minute. Hopefully, I have time to go through it. You know, we'll be going through to see what is their plan for the balance sheet runoff. Okay, are they going to be doing it to be so hawkish to the point where we are supposed to be worried? Or is it just going to be like what I said before? Not new news, basically just Leo Brainard kind of just re-emphasizing the fact that we are going to be uh, doing a balance sheet runoff and people are just scared for nothing. Okay, I'm not sure if it's going to be the former or the latter, but that's going to be happening at 2 a.m. later on. So, of course, that's going to be something interesting for me to really look into as well. All right. Anyway, I think that's all that we do have for today's news. Um, yeah, I think... Yeah, basically, that's about it, you know, oil prices, gas prices, um, and such. But anyway, yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.